Well, not quite. We will, but not this week. We got to um, we got to uh, start reviewing. You're going to have a test eventually next week on World War II, so we got to all uh, start reviewing that. The Cold War isn't even cold. Yes, yes, Jaden, it is not cold. It's it's the term cold means something else. We'll learn all about that um, in May, though, so we'll get there in a little bit. So how does the world try and avoid World War III from happening? Um, that is the focus for today. We're looking at a couple of things, um, but does anyone remember this question from the Jew now? I, I assume most will not. It's okay. After World War I, President Wilson, President Woodrow Wilson, tries to create something for the world. Um, a lot of countries are supposed to join it, and they wanted to promote peace to prevent a World War II from happening. Do you guys remember what this was called? Not the United Nations, not the New Deal. Good try. Treaty of Versailles. Treaty of Versailles. It came after the. It came along with the Treaty of Versailles. Your your guys are close. I'll put the acronym in the chat. L O N. Those are the initials. A good thing we don't have a final at the end of the year. I'll give you the first word. League of, League of Nations. There you go. Okay, so the League of Nations main goal we learned was to prevent a World War II. It was a failure. Well, number one, the United States didn't even join it ever. Number two, it ended up being a, a catastrophe in the fact that its main goal was to prevent a World War II. And we just had a unit on World War II, and it was probably the worst war in world history. So it was, you know, ultimately a failure. So there's two things we need to wrap up at the end of World War II right now, okay? We want to look at something that, you know, has to do with the Holocaust, and then we want to look at something called the United Nations. So the first slides you're copying down are known as the Nuremberg Trials. This is related to the Holocaust, because remember, we talked about the Holocaust earlier on for a few lessons, um, we saw what it was about, how it started, you know, we saw the pictures from it, but then we just kind of stopped it. When World War II ends, okay, so does the Holocaust. All right, so now we want to talk about what happens after the Holocaust ends, which is known as these Nuremberg trials. So I'll give you a minute to copy this down. Sebastian, yeah, it's going to be a long court case because there's a lot of people involved. It does take a while. So Nuremberg um, is out over in Europe, and basically we have a tough situation. The leader of the Holocaust, Adolf Hitler, has committed suicide. So he's the one ultimately most responsible for the Holocaust. There's no question about that. The problem then becomes, though, if he was the most responsible and he has passed away, does that mean everyone else in Germany at this point is innocent? And the answer is no. Okay, they are not innocent. There were many people in Germany who had to do with the Holocaust, that helped out, that made decisions. So we want to put them on trial, essentially, and see what their punishment is. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question in the chat, in all seriousness. If Mr. Pani was a soldier in World War II or any war, and I happened to kill a couple of other soldiers... When the war is over, do I go to jail if I was to kill soldiers from another country? Tough question, right? When the war is over, and if I had killed soldiers on the enemy team, do I go to jail for that when the war is over? Okay, so no, I don't know, no. Okay, Nina, yeah, no, because that was the point of the war. Okay, so good. So essentially, ladies and gentlemen, okay, essentially, no, I don't go to war for enemy, for me killing enemy soldiers. However, there are rules of war. We talked about in World War I, you're not allowed to use chemical warfare. You're not allowed to kill innocent people without reason. 
okay? Essentially, in a war, you have to follow certain uh, conduct of rules. If you don't, that is considered a war crime, and you could be put on trial for that. The Holocaust is a perfect example of a war crime. The Jewish people that were put into the concentration camps had nothing to do with fighting the war. This was a, uh, a plan put out by Hitler that was obviously horrible in every sense of the word. So since this was not really a part of World War II and the fighting, this was something separate, they're going to be put on trial for war crimes, okay? And I know it may be a little tough to see, but if you zoom in a little bit on the picture, you'll notice that there are basically rows of German leaders and they get different um, punishments depending on what they did. So like this particular guy here, if you follow my mouse, he's going to jail for 10 years. The guy to his right, he's going to jail for life. The guy to his right's going to jail for 20 years. The guy to his right, he's sentenced to death. Okay, so depending on what they did in the Holocaust, maybe they carried out some plans, maybe they carried out some executions, they were put on to trial and sentenced to whatever crime they um, were found. Uh, so many Nazi party leaders who did not commit suicide like Hitler before the war ended, they were convicted, they were thrown in jail, they were executed. This is a good way to keep the people who had done these things in the Holocaust accountable for what they did. And many of them were served life in prison or were killed because of it. Okay, executed. All right. Any questions on that before I move on? So this is the way we kind of wrap up the Holocaust. We can never take back the 6 million lives that were lost, but we can at least hold the people who are responsible accountable for what they did. Okay. Let's go into the final slide for today before we get into the assignment. Okay. You just have to write down the United Nations. I repeat, you just have to write down the United Nations. You don't need to write down what NATO is. NATO is for my um, regions class. They're both in yellow, but please just copy down the United Nations. All right, so I'll give you a minute to do that, and we're going to now figure out what this organization does. All right, guys, so the United Nations is very similar to the League of Nations with some differences, okay? Now, when you get to 11th grade U.S. history, you'll go into a lot more detail on this. We just need to be familiar with what the United Nations is and what it kind of does. So picture how after World War II, you have all these countries just decimated from the war, and they want to prevent that from happening again. So the major goal of the United Nations is to prevent a World War III from ever occurring. And even though the United Nations is not a perfect organization, we've never had a World War III. If you haven't noticed that, okay, there hasn't been a World War III. So it has been largely successful in preventing that. Okay, what does it do? Well, it's an organization where representatives from every country around the world are going to meet and this is going to sound crazy. They're going to meet and they're going to talk. Okay. They're literally just going to meet and they're going to talk. It's like one giant world therapy session. All right. And the major. Isn't like the League of Nations? Say that again. Isn't, isn't the United Nations like the League of Nations? It but is like, very similar, but a lot more successful. Yes. Oh, because like they were like pretty much like solving any like anything that happened between the, the countries before the actual thing breaks out. Right. So let's say there's a dispute or a problem between countries around the world. 
they are meant to meet in the United Nations to try and talk it out. All right, so if countries are angry, if, if countries are poor, if there's a disease, okay, if there is someone on the brink of war, everyone's expected to meet in the United Nations and to peacefully talk things out. Now, if you've ever seen a photo of the United Nations, okay, you can look one up now if you'd like. They're all meeting in a, um, like a circular room for the most part, and they all have headphones on. And the reason why they all have headphones is these are representatives from all over the world, so they all speak in different languages. Okay, so if I'm speaking English right now, the leaders from China and Russia and Pakistan may not understand the language. So they're wearing headphones so they can translate. Okay? No, some of them aren't going to get executed. No, Sebastian. Okay. All right. This is more of a, a group to kind of prevent a problem from ever happening. All right. Now, the United Nations at this point in time, okay, is going to be developed in a very similar way to the United States government. Okay, so like our government, we have representatives that come in and speak on our behalf. The United Nations are going to have representatives that come in from other countries to talk things through. I'm going to get a photo of the UN right now. Do you guys know where the United Nations is located in the United States? Because they're located all around the world. Isn't it? Um, sorry. One is in Manhattan. Correct. Not too far from here. Okay. And you'll see things like this. I'll just... Uh, all right, so I'm just going to share this tab here. Just see a bunch of them. If you go to the Manhattan, you'll see all the flags outside. Those are all the representatives of all the countries that are in the United Nations. All right? So you look here. All right, I'm trying to get an indoor photo. Okay, so it's like an indoor photo. They're all sitting at a desk. They're all wearing headphones so they can kind of see, you know, they can discuss all of their problems. And if you can understand what a therapy session is like, this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to prevent another war from happening. Now, since the United States was one of the main architects of the United Nations, specifically, we don't speak about her enough in this class, Eleanor Roosevelt, um, who was very instrumental in creating the League of Nations. Um, she was the first lady, uh, the first, uh, the wife of Franklin D. Roosevelt. This was her big contribution, and uh, she created the, helped create the United Nations. Okay, the United Nations um, is set up very much similar to how the United States is set up in terms of how our government operates. So we'll have our legislative branch, right? They're the ones who make the laws. Well, the United Nations is going to have a general assembly. Okay, we have our president in the executive branch, right? Well, in the United Nations, you're going to have the general secretary. Okay, they're going to be the leader of the United Nations. So it's going to work very similar. I don't want to go into too much detail because that's what your reading will do. But ultimately, this is what you're going to be reading about here going forward. You can go on. All right. So with that being said, let's just look at today's assignment. All the notes should be down. Okay, guys, so you see it. You know how to do it at this point, right? Reading. It's best to read from the top left to the top right to the bottom left to the bottom right. Okay? Do the reading on your own. It should be plenty easy. It's written on a seventh grade level, so I don't think it should be too difficult for you guys. Okay? These 13 questions here, all of them can be done on the Google Doc here. Okay, that's what you're doing. Do you guys have questions? No questions asked. Okay, you have 20 minutes to work on this. There's no reason this can't get done, but if you can't, it's due by the end of the, the day today. All right, I'll be here if you have questions.